bank. So I've worked for some some very big players in the investment banking industry. Um, the, the salary and the bonuses were were good, uh, but I never really felt comfortable in that role. I never saw a role model ahead of me, a manager uh, that I wanted to be like in the future. So I was always trying to find ways to um, have some kind of, I guess people call it a side hustle now. Um, I was just trying to like build wealth in other ways or build experience in other ways. So uh, over the course of a long period of time, I self-taught myself about uh, real estate, uh, developing, actually building, and also investing in, in equities and crypto. How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to The Real FI Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick McGrath, with my co-host, James Ripion. How's it going today, James? Going well, man. I'm super excited about today's episode. We've got Jeremy Stevenson with us today. I feel like I'm sitting on a beach in Mexico, uh, just looking at Jeremy's screen. Uh, he's got a lot of interesting background and cool investment opportunities that he's been getting into that he's really going to dive into. And I think, you know, we're just really going to have a great conversation. So, you know, without further ado, let's let's get into it. So, Jeremy, um, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and give us a little bit about your background and tell us about, you know, a little bit about your history? Sure. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm from London. Um, I, I know that you guys talk about uh, having a career and trying to kick the nine to five. So I, uh, I, I did all of that. And uh, now I, I sort of quit my job a couple of years ago. Um, so leading up to that, I, um, yeah, I mean, when I was born back in the 80s, you know, Margaret Thatcher was, uh, was, was basically removing all the coal mines and transferring all of the wealth and opportunity to investment banking in the South in London. And that's where I was born. I was born in a, a small, like uh, a coal mining town, essentially. Um, and my my parents decided for us to leave that area and come to a little town outside London called Watford. And um, that's where, I don't know, like if you know Elton John and Jerry, Jerry Halliwell are from. So it's a small market town there. So I grew up there just in the cusp of, of London. Um, and so over time, um, you know, my, my mom and dad sort of fell out and, uh, it was just me and my mom. So we, we didn't really have much money. So from a really early age, I was kind of thinking about, you know, what, what can I do to try and earn money? Um, and going out, washing cars, all that kind of thing. So from an early age, you know, thinking about money and prioritizing that, uh, became really important to me. And I think that's really important for your listeners um, uh, to understand like the mindset and how entrenched that is from an early age. Um, so fast forward a few years, I, um, I went to university, uh, did economics and finance because through the 80s, there was a lot of success in the investment banking industry. And I really wanted to get into that environment, that in arena. Um, so I actually went and read economics and finance, and then I went, I actually went to an accountancy firm, uh, PwC, got my CPA there, and then I went to Goldman Sachs. So, um, both of these companies are very corporate. The, the, it's really interesting that everyone still calls it the nine to five now, because it's really the eight till seven, or some days it's the seven till 10 and people are really, really burnt out. And if it was the nine till five. Uh, people wouldn't wouldn't really be trying to get out of this, uh, you know, so much. Um, so I went to Goldman Sachs and I um, moved to an investment banking consultancy and worked for JP Morgan in Hong Kong and then came back to London and worked at, at Deutsche Bank. So I've worked for some, some very big players in the investment banking industry. Um, the, the salary and the bonuses were, were good, uh, but I never really felt comfortable in that role. I never saw a role model ahead of me, a manager uh, that I wanted to be like in the future. So I was always trying to find ways to um, have some kind of, I guess people call it a side hustle now. Um, I was just trying to like build wealth in other ways or build experience in other ways. So uh, over the course of a long period of time, I self-taught myself about uh, real estate, uh, developing, actually building, and also investing in, in equities and crypto uh, over a long period of time. And, and sort of now I'm here uh, living in Tulum, still investing 
in real estate and actually trying to help people through our brokerage, uh, you know, achieve financial independence and try and further their agenda and get to their goals through real estate in Mexico. So I'm, I'm very curious, Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, PwC, you know, it's hard to name any more big hitters in the, the financial industry. Um, so, you know, what was it about the culture at these institutions that kind of made you think, you know, maybe I'd be better off taking my life in a different direction? Because, you know, you hear people who work at these kind of places and they've got golden handcuffs um, and they incentivize people to stay and grind for a long period of time. And yeah. it's not like it, it's an easy thing to just walk away from all the money, the bonuses and things like that. So, you know, what what was it about that? culture specifically generally with those institutions that you know made you feel good about leaving it behind yeah it was is a few things actually because um when i was a young kid growing up um i was kind of obsessed with all these news stories about um people on the fruit and veg stand in essex going to the city and then becoming like a multi-million dollar trader and earning lots of money that stuff all happened in the 90s, like in the early 90s, mid 90s. And then um, in the noughties, that was still happening. And then we had the financial crisis in 07, 08. And that, re that really, really whacked uh, salaries and the value that could be extracted from investment banking. Um, during that uh, 15 or, or so years, you had more and more uh, players moving into investment banking and accountancy. So, you know, initially when you go into an accountancy firm like PwC, you always look at the partners and think, I want to be like them. You know, they're dri driving really nice cars. They've got really nice houses. Uh, their children go to private school. I want to be like them. But what people don't adjust for is the forward uh, trajectory of salary and earnings which is largely determined by the amount of value in that industry. Um, so with audit and tax, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, as more and more businesses uh, were, were getting more global, having a more of a, a globalized agenda, they were making much more money on their tax, their, their tax services. And then as the kind of uh, financial uh, regulation became more complex, like IFRS, Sarbanes-Oxley, all of this kind of stuff, the audit teams were making more uh, there. So you have this kind of bell curve where when the industry starts in its infancy, you know, people aren't making that much money and then you reach a peak and then it tapers off as competition and other kind of pressures drive the amount of value in that industry down. And so when I got to Price Waterhouse, I was seeing that happen across the accounting and audit and tax industry. And, you know, at a, at a kind of micro level from my experience every, every day, I didn't really enjoy the environment I was in. I don't feel like I was learning enough uh, quickly enough and I also didn't see any role models that piqued my interest that made it worth all the long hours so um, you know that was that was the PwC thing then going into banking very much the same kind of thing you know people used to earn a lot of money uh, and and have a really really nice lifestyle but over the years as I got to know more and more senior people and work with them I, it became really clear to me that their time was not their own time and their compensation packages compared to their predecessors were actually coming down at an alarming rate. So me as a younger guy, you know, in my late twenties, if you try and extrapolate that trend out, uh, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't look good for me. And there was this feeling uh, that I, I needed to get out. And yeah, you know, I was, I was earning quite a considerable uh, salary and bonus package when I left. Um, but Thankfully, in parallel to my career, I was building up um, some investments on the side so I could could leave that with confidence. I think that's fantastic. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that's fantastic because, you know, you basically worked at the epitome of, you know, jobs that everybody talks about, you know, for the for the companies that everybody talks about. And you got to be around all those big players and see the lifestyles that they had that everyone thinks that they want. Everyone thinks that they dream of when they're younger. And you, like you said, you realized that 
it's not all glitz and glam once you get once you get there. It's not million dollar paychecks. It's not about the big houses because, like you said, their time wasn't their time. They're beholden to the company. They're beholden to the giant companies that they're responsible for. So there's no work life balance. There's no time freedom because when someone calls, you got to pick up the phone. You have to be there. You know when you're talking about millions and billion dollar companies. And, you know, you're a partner in some of these. Um, it may, you know, the uh, the allure looks good, but you got an inside peek behind the curtain and found yeah. out that yeah. it's not the life that you wanted to live or the person that you wanted to become is what it sounded like. Yeah, absolutely. When you think, OK, some guys say earn a million dollars in comp last year. Well, 50 percent of that is in deferred compensation, uh, deferred stock uh, vests over four years. And you get tranches of that over time. So that ties you in to another four years. Um, and, you know, the investment banking industry, part of my role was analyzing the market and doing competitive analysis. Uh, and I could see that spreads, are, you know, were, were becoming razor thin and businesses were losing money. And so, um, yeah, it was I was always trying to find a way out or a way to just make money on the side that was repeatable um, and as low risk as possible. So, so let's get into some of that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, as, as you were you know, building up your, your parallel investment opportunities, um, when you were looking at some of your peers, what were they doing with their money? Were they doing some of the same things, like trying to build up their asset base and build that kind of parachute uh, so they could transition to something else? Or were they kind of just blowing their money, trying to live that lifestyle that they were seeing in the partners? It was it was the the latter, and I think um, y- you know it, it was. I didn't really have any buddies that were investing in real estate. I didn't have any buddies who were uh, necessarily in- investing in whiskey or spending you know weeks and weeks and weeks looking at a spreadsheet trying to figure out equities after everyone's like talking about COVID, right? So I think a lot of people who who weren't so obsessed with money or really really frightened of being poor they you know maybe came from a middle class background um with you know mother and father they had stability so they didn't feel the need to obsess around cash and financial independence because they felt that it would always be there perhaps they had like an inheritance uh that their mother and father's house their family home would be worth something um and they would get that passed down to them so with me though there was this from an early age there was this like real uh anxiety it wasn't really a positive desire to be successful or be a millionaire or billionaire or whatever for my own ego or status it was more just to be to 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 reduce anxiety about you know being poor i never wanted to be in my parents position and um i never wanted my children to feel that way either so i was i was always trying to to try and make money but on my own terms because i i i also valued my freedom and I saw that these guys at the top of the corporate corporate ladder were really, they didn't seem to be having that much fun to be, to be perfectly honest. Exactly. I mean, I, I, I can relate somewhat to that, not in your position, but just in some of the, some of the companies that I worked for before. And I think there's so many other people that are listening right now that can relate to that too. And I really kind of want to, you know, fast forward just a smidge and kind of get into what were those, you know, side hustles, side things that you were parallel doing at the time? And let's kind of get into those because those things that you were doing at the time parallel to working for these giant companies are what led you to get that time freedom, to get that financial freedom and to get that yeah. anxiety level and stress level down. So let, let's get into some of the things that you were investing in. Sure. Um, well, it, it, it started uh it was a really long process of uh, not really having any money or any buying power. Um, so when I was uh, 24, I just uh, qualified as a CPA with Price Waterhouse Coopers. I managed to uh, double my salary by moving to Goldman Sachs. And so I think that there's there's two things that you have to really try and do, like put yourself into an industry that that pays well, and then move when it when the opportunity arises. Try and always seek that. Um, that upside in your salary because the salary can give you 
um, that platform to start saving. And I was aggressively saving. I was trying to save, you know, 50% of, of what I was making. I lived at home until I was 28. You know, I got the train into London, uh, you know, hour and a half every day, uh, back and forward. So, you know, it's three hours commuting. And um, yeah, you know, I would go out Thursday, Friday and Saturday night and just stay at my friend's house or whatever in London when I couldn't get the train back. But there was a lot of sacrifice. Um, so the first thing I did was in in, in 2010. Um, yeah, so I was, I was about 25 years old. I had uh, $1,800. Uh, that was the, the only cash I had. And uh, my, my manager at, at Goldman Sachs, he was quite into whiskey. And he talked about this new uh, whiskey that had just been produced by Glenn Fiddich. And there was a huge story about it because at the time in 2010, we we're having huge snowfall that was completely unprecedented. And so this snow stacked up on the distillery warehouse roof and it caved in and it smashed open all the whiskey casks. And so you've got 10 year, 12 year, 18 year, all these amazing single malt, single vintage whiskeys just completely opened up. And so the, the master uh, distiller, Ben Kinsman, he got all his guys together on site and they started putting this together. So anyway, they, this was the first time that Glen Fiddich had ever made a blended uh, whiskey, a blended scotch. And so I love the story around it. And I think whiskey collectors like that, that kind of story. So I thought, okay, this is interesting. How do I buy some? Uh, I went down to, uh, there's a whiskey shop called the Whiskey Store. And it's a nationwide chain. And I asked the guy, I said, Snow, uh, Glen Phoenix, Snow Phoenix, how do I get some? What do you think the investment potential is? He said, it's a great bottle. You're going to make money on it. But we only got 10 bottles as a nationwide chain of whiskey um, you know, distributors. So good luck finding that. And, uh, and I said to him, well, actually, my, uh, my, my friend just found it online, Waitrose Wine Club, which is just a supermarket, right? And, uh, and I actually bought two cases and I left, I left the, the whiskey shop, went up, told my boss and he went down and spoke to the same guy. And uh, the guy said, well, we don't have any in stock, but this, uh, this really arrogant little, uh, little shit came in and told us that he just found two cases online at Waitrose Wine Club. So there you go. So, uh, so I bought that at um, $75 a bottle. And it's now retailing at just under a thousand dollars per bottle, so it's a profit of around twelve hundred percent. But I have amazing. Had... Yeah, it's that's just... amazing. Have you pop? Did you pop one open at least? I mean, <laughs> I popped one with my dad, and that that put him to sleep <laughs> <laughs> over Christmas. I messed him up. My mum was not happy with me. But uh, yeah, that's so that's like 1200% profit. I still have them. Uh, I bought two cases, so 24 bottles, drunk one with my dad. So I've got, yeah, $23,000 of whiskey from, uh, it was initially about $3,000 I spent. So that's, yeah, I mean, you can't buy a Ferrari with it, but it's still, uh, you know, trying to get into that, um, you know, appraising the demand and supply of a particular asset. Um, but yeah, I still have that. What's what's the long term plan with that? Are you just going to hold it for the next twenty years and kind of see what happens, or do you think you might start offloading them bottle at a time every other year? I I I wanted to actually keep them as gifts for like really important people in my life. So uh, so I think the first bottle will go to my my girlfriend's dad, and hopefully that will uh will like grease the wheels of a conversation that we obviously need to have soon. There um, you go. And uh, yeah, and I think, you know, people in, in Asia really love whiskey. Um, so I think it's, it'd be quite good for business deals. But yeah, I have, I have no plans in selling it anytime soon. What a great gift. What a great gift. All right. So we got, so you're going through the whiskey, you know, the wheels are turning, like you, you got to, you figured out a way to, you know, buy something, make some money. So where's it go from there? Yeah, so um, a few years later, uh, I've been saving up as much money as I could. Um, and, you, you know, I was, I was 28 at the time, 27, 28. And everyone's talking about, you know, potentially buying a property, buying a flat in London. So I, I had some cash saved up and um, from working. And 
I was having a look, a look around, looking at up and coming areas and focusing on um, buying an apartment that I could renovate. So a distressed property where maybe you know the owner um, needs to get out. They've got a financial situation that they need to take care of. They're going through a divorce, probate, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I was looking at local authority housing. So ex local council, I don't know if you guys call it like section eight or whatever, but um, like really low end, low income housing. Uh, buy one of those in an up and coming area that was going to be gentrified um, that hipsters were living basically. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I found this property and it was, it was on the market for 220,000 pounds um which was way over my budget um and i but i still went to the showing i went there it was a duplex it was two story it was enormous like by our standards in in england in london and i thought there is no way i'm ever going to get this I, I don't even know why i'm here and but i i still went and it was a group tour it was a hot market in hackney back in 2013 and um There was a group tour, so the estate agent was there. There were about eight guys in there, guys and girls in there, all looking around. I get there late because I'm running from work. And the estate agent said, right, we're all here now. Let's go upstairs. And I'm kind of like looking around the place thinking, okay, I just got here. Let's try and get a handle of it. And I see the group move upstairs. And there's one guy who doesn't go upstairs. He sits downstairs on the radiator. And I'm like thinking, this guy's got to be the owner. And so I go and uh, go and sit next to him. I said, hey, how you doing? My name's Jeremy. Uh, you're not going with the tour, I guess. Are you the owner? And he's like, yeah, I'm the owner. And I said to him, I really love this apartment. It's amazing. Um, I work, I work in, in finance. I work in the bank. I was dressed in a suit and tie. I said, I've got the mortgage in principle. I've got the mortgage offer. I've got all the cash ready. We can do a deal like tomorrow if you're, you know, if you're up for it. And uh, I took his details. I took his phone number. I took his email. Um, and I basically offered on the spot £195,000, which is you know, 25 under asking. And just you know really tried to convince this guy that I could get the deal done and I wouldn't waste his time. Um, and so you know, he, over time, we, we were emailing and he accepted the offer. I didn't have £195,000 to do it. Um, but I knew if I could just get him on the hook, then maybe, you know, something will open up. I was completely out of my depth. Like I'd never bought real estate before. And then, so as time went by, I met him a couple of times and he told me that he wanted to go to, to New York in November and he was saving up money for that trip. So I thought, okay, fine. So you have a finite time period that you need the cash in for. Uh, and the place was a little bit run down. And these blocks that were built in the 60s and 70s used a lot of asbestos, which was you know, something that needed to be taken care of. So I got an asbestos inspector in. Um, I got a plumber, electrician. I got them to cost up all the work to renovate it and just put it as high as possible. And uh, I managed to go from 195000 down to 173000 So that's around two hundred thousand dollars so i managed to get the price down a lot um just by you know sandbagging and delaying and 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 just saying this this property is not what i thought it was you know um so put the offer in i paid uh, a deposit a down payment of 25 percent, which is about sixty thousand dollars and then my refurb cost me about fourteen thousand dollars so 14, 15. So all in, I'm in, I'm in for around um, $70,000, call it $75,000 with, with fees, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, so the other thing that was happening at the time was I was going to move to Hong Kong and they asked me to move in uh, March, the following year, March, 2014. And I just completed on this on this apartment in November. So I had, you know, the best part of four months to turn the whole thing around and get it rented out. Four months, never done a renovation before. Um, so, you know, I, I basically just did a lot of the renovation myself. I hired in one contractor on a day rate. Um, I did the tiling myself in the bathroom. My dad helped me. 
Uh, we did all the kitchen. We put the kitchen together ourselves. I did a lot of the plumbing in the place myself. And we, you know, we worked so hard to try and get it done in four, four months. And that was four months of pure sacrifice. Like I didn't leave the apartment. I didn't, Friday nights, I didn't go out with my friends. I was just like, you know, covered in dust and paint the whole time. Uh, I didn't have like a bathroom. So like when, when we were refitting the toilet in the bathroom, I was going to use the toilet at the gym. I was going to the gym and, um, you know, showering there before work, getting into a suit and tie and everything. And I was eating at the local kebab store. I had no kitchen. So I was living in a building site for four months. And I remember when I got the, the flight out to Hong Kong on that day, which was a Sunday, I was still hammering in. Uh, a, a, a telephone, a, a power cable for the broadband router, and it's black and the walls are white, so I had to paint it white, like on the morning of the flight. So I was really <laughs> up against it, um, but that that deal was that deal was great um, in terms of the numbers. So I was in for seventy five thousand uh, dollars. I, I rented it for thirty two months. I went to Hong Kong, and when I came back to London, I continued renting it. I was making, I made $25,000 on the rental um, for the, for almost three years. And then I sold it for and, uh, $440,000. So in total, I made $250,000 in, in three years. That's such and an I, awesome first investment. Like, and I, I, I mean, I, I absolutely love the fact that, you know, here you are working for some of the most prestigious companies in the world, yet you're like living in an apartment with no bathroom, no kitchen, like just doing everything in your power to make this happen. Cause you're like, I, I saved up all this money. I believe it's going to work and I'm just going to sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice to make this happen. Like talking to the owner, like, queuing in on those little tiny details that a lot of people just don't even pick up on. And you were like, all right, I'm going to go talk to this guy. Something's up. And being able to do like a direct to seller, like negotiating, finding the contractors, you and your dad doing all the work. It's like what I think almost every first time real estate investor like kind of needs to do um, to really get your hands dirty, get your feet dirty, you know, get in there and and make it work. So then you kind of realize why down the road, it makes sense. You know, you know, the time and effort it takes to actually do it. So you're like, okay, we can hire that out down the road. I, I did it once. I know, I know the value of my time, but at least I know it works now. Right. That's, that's exactly it. That's exactly the, the kind of rite of passage. Um, so yeah, that, that was, um, that was a really great, great investment. Um, I was, I felt lucky doing that one um, for sure. Yeah. So, so, all right. So you, you got your first deal, you know, you, you did the whiskey thing. You got your first real estate thing. You're going to Hong Kong. Like you said, that was three years in between that time. And when you came back to London, you still rented it out. So, you know, let, let's fast forward just, just a little bit and get to kind of like the year before you're getting ready to like, you know, snip the cord and finally go out on your own like let, let's where, where where are you at in that particular time with you know your investments and all of that yeah so um it was i mean it was i mean bef i one of the important things i think about going to hong kong is that it's a it's a low tax jurisdiction i think if you if you move to singapore you can net what an average UK person, let's say you have the same gross salary. In Singapore, uh, you can net in one year what it takes a UK person to, to net in four, in four years. So the tax benefits of being in a low tax jurisdiction that's civilized, that has a really great expat community where you can have fun and career progression, hands down, it's a, an amazing, amazing trade for a career. And so I only spent 18 months in, in Hong Kong, actually. But in 18 months, because uh, one of my bonuses was paid out there, at, um, I was able to save up around 100 and 120,000 US, which is quite a lot, right? And uh, when I came back to London, I bought 
another apartment same kind of thing but in a better location um much more money it was uh, around half a million dollars with a mortgage um so i was living there and i was rent i was i was doing that as well i was i was um i was renovating that but i spent more money on it and i spent more time on it all the finishes were a lot higher and then i had a, a buddy come and live with me and rent with me so i had that kind of foundation of living in that apartment and having some income by renting a room out which is a good strategy i was making a uh, 1300 dollars um rental revenue from that per month from my friend and just trying to keep saving money while i'm back in the uk um and then with that cash that i uh, sorry that once i completed the build i decided to sell the the other place um made that cash and you know i had around it was about 300 yeah it was about three hundred thousand dollars in cash and then i was looking for opportunities i met up with some guys that i used to work with at pwc we tried to do some care home investments in scotland um tried to do a couple of other sort of business ventures where i spent some money it didn't really work out well and the care home thing uh, got completely squashed by COVID. You know, the commercial real estate market collapsed. No one really knew what the hell was going on. And I didn't speak to those guys, but I still had my 300K cash and I sat on it for, for pretty much four years, four years. And so this is one of the, the other things that a lot of successful investors talk about is waiting for the right deal and having patience. You know, don't chase a 5% or an 8% return, wait for those big ones where you can double uh, or triple like that. The, the apartment that I bought that I made, you know, 300% uh, profit on, I was looking for a deal like that. I didn't want a 10% coupon. Um, and that's why it took me four years. So anyway, I have this cash. Um, we're, st we're in, you know, February 2020 now. The world's looking a, a, a bit sketchy. I just returned from the Philippines where everyone in the airport's wearing a face mask. You know, what the hell's going on? Come back to the UK, no one's wearing a face mask. They, they don't even know what COVID is, right, back there. And I'm thinking, okay, what's going on? We go skiing in France and the, the stock market is going crazy. There's a lot of volatility. And I'm trying, trying to trade that volatility through a spread betting uh, platform and, and losing a lot of money. Uh, like I probably lost $10,000 on that ski trip. Um, but I'm, I'm plugged into the equities market now. And that's, you know, where I'm looking at. I think it's really important to, to be able to shift into different asset classes, learn about them, and try and see if you can exploit an opportunistic, um, you know, period of time. So um, the reason why I was spread betting is because I had spent some time uh, for a few years of, of messing around with spread betting, I came out down. Actually, I lost probably uh, $20,000 spread betting, but I knew how to do it. I sort of knew about the equity market from that and from my job as well. Um, and so when COVID hit, I started putting money into a Charles Schwab account, a brokerage account. And at the same time, I spent six and a half weeks of building a spreadsheet uh 300 companies in the us and china with i had 40 different columns we were looking at um analysts uh reports of the company then their revenue their costs uh in terms of like cost of sales operating costs their balance sheet assets liabilities just to get a picture of all of these companies and see if there were any companies that would come out of COVID, that went into COVID quite well positioned from a liquidity perspective, that would ride the storm and come out of COVID in a really, really, um, in a really great uh, like manner. And the only way to do that is to really delve into the numbers and it's free to get financial information. So, you know, I knew about balance sheets, income statements from my uh, job as an accountant and I was just going through all, all of these. I spent six and a half weeks. I was spending sometimes 18 hours a day in front of that spreadsheet, just building up, um, you know, a, a really good understanding of which indust industries would come out okay, which industries would ben benefit from cheap cash if interest rates go to zero and the Fed start printing. 
And I, I basically put all my cash into that Charles Schwab account. I still had my property in London, but I um, put basically every, every last penny that I had into the Charles Schwab account and started running that portfolio myself okay. with no experience of, of trading equities apart from, you know, un, unsuspect, un, unsuccessful spread betting. And I lost some money on some stocks before in the past. Um, and so that was, uh, that, that was an amazing year for people who chose to, to play in that game. And I, I put my first deposit on March the 17th, it was $25,000. I think you have, you can only put 25,000 in at a time. I put my first deposit in on March the 17th. And that was when, uh, Bill Ackman went to CNBC and was on the phone. And he was basically sounded like he was crying about how the world is going to end um you know credit spreads went crazy and now we know that he took out a massive credit default swap he took out insurance on all of these different industries and and the S&P um but that is that is really fortunate uh, buying the bottom essentially and so i you know kept putting in i bought you know everyone was going on about tesla and at one point, I had 69 shares in Tesla, obviously 69, ha, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> Great number to start with. <clears throat> yeah. And that was before stock split. That was before, that was when, you know, everyone thought Elon was crazy. Um, and then I started looking for, uh, you know, analogies. So Tesla is a great stock. The market love it. Electric cars. We understand the fundamentals. What's the Chinese version of that? And can I get it on the ADR market? So we, I looked at NEO. So I bought NEO at $3. And, you know, eventually I, I loaded up leverage on options and everything. And I think I sold out around $50 on, on NEO. I had quite a large position on there. Probably uh, my market value on NEO was $230,000 at one point. Wow. And, yeah, it's lumpy to have in like a, you know, a Chinese ADR when there was all this talk about the US versus Hong Kong and all that TikTok stuff and sharing of information and, and spying and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, the US, the SEC basically threatening to remove uh, Chinese ADRs. So there was a lot of volatility in that trade. Um, but yeah, Neo was 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 a fantastic stock. So, so what, what did your overall returns look like in your portfolio over the last two years? You know, investing in equities because a lot of our listeners focus on real estate and they're used to the clipping that coupon on a monthly basis again. Those rental sure. incomes in and they're looking at their cash on cash return. But you know, you saw an opportunity. I was just looking it up on um, online. Tesla, you know, has went up about twelve hundred percent from the time that you yeah. bought early March till its peak. Uh, and it's still, you know, relatively way high compared to where you yeah. bought it. But, you know, what did your portfolio returns look like in equities from the time you got into, you know, it was a double. Right so it was, it was, it was a hundred percent. I mean, I, I took a massive bath in February, uh, 2021. Like I, I lost like $300,000. My portfolio went down $300,000 in the space of two weeks uh and so i was running around a million dollars of risk after that and um so my my returns yeah i mean it was like after tax and everything it was about like it was about a double it was about 100 percent return so and you I, basically turned your 300 into 600 yeah after taxes and everything yeah so i mean that's I mean, that that's more like, you know, a three X, you know, because you paid at least a third of that in tax. Right. Yeah, it was it was quite punitive. Yeah. Um, to say the least. But um, yeah, it was that that tra that that whole trading thing, because you had so many people getting into it on a quite a small scale. You know, you had Robin Hood and all of that kind of stuff and Reddit um that that was a crazy time mm -hmm. and i i just remember i remember i invested in in square i was long the stock anyway and i got long the options the call option was seemed to be okay in the pricing they blew out and in two weeks the profit was like 100 grand hundred thousand dollars on square on one position 
And I was just like, this is crazy. Like, how can it continue? But we had that wobble in Feb uh, when the Fed started talking about tightening. And yeah, my portfolio came down huge. And uh, I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm cashing out. Uh, I don't want to wear this volatility anymore. So that, yeah, I, I, I pretty much sold everything that summer. Gotcha. So, so you, you've cashed out, you know, you've, you've clocked in these great returns. You've doubled, doubled your money. Where, where are you going from, from there? And what, what does your next opportunity look like? Um, so, yeah, so I, I actually, I quit my job and uh, I, I um, actually, I quit my job while I was still running that portfolio. Um, but I, I, I came with a friend to Texas uh, he needs to get some contacts done, couldn't get them done in the UK. It's got a very strange uh, problem with his eyes. And so we spent a month in Texas, but in order to get into Texas, we had to do two weeks in Mexico. So he picked Playa del Carmen for us. And um, yeah, I, I loved it there. I thought it was great. So we, we stayed in Playa del Carmen for two weeks, went to Texas, did a bit of traveling around the States, and I came back to Playa del Carmen um, with, with cash in my uh, Charles Schwab account. And so um, then I started to get into a little bit of crypto. And I really, I'm, I'm quite uh, old fashioned, I'd say. Like it took me a really long time to uh, get on like mobile phones and texting like when I was a kid and the internet, email, I was a big naysayer of all this stuff, all these new technologies. I was so old fashioned and, and, and um, inflexible in my approach. And the same thing with crypto. I was a massive naysayer about it. I didn't even care about it or look at it. But yeah, I was, um, I was, I, I started to get a real interest into that, start to educate myself. And the way I do that is just line up, you know, 10 hours of YouTube on a playlist. The, the guys have got the most views and likes put it on 2x with the subtitles on and sit in the room for 10 hours or whatever it takes to learn everything that you need to learn. Um, and then I started, all, you know, trading a little bit. I used bots as well to trade. So I, I broke up my portfolio. Um, it was about 800 at the time in, in crypto. So I did a lot of stable coin lending, some yield farming, and I also did um, some futures trading with bots. I would put, you know, ten thousand dollars to a few different strategies, but try and um, try and uh, keep my risk uh, contained. Um, so anyway, awesome. uh, those, those bots blew through the cash in in a month. I lost like oh, 10, man. It's so stupid. I said to myself, "You can't make any money with trading bots. It's dumb." But I, I really think that you know, all these people on online and like big investors always talk about being like perfectly rational all the time. I don't think, you know, we're humans, right? I think it's really difficult to, to act rationally all the time. And I met some new friends in Playa del Carmen and they were like, oh yeah, we're making amazing returns of this bot. And I thought they were, I think they are reputable people. I got involved um, and yeah, lost, lost a bit of cash there. So I, um, I kind of my my crypto gains sort of offset the losses, and so I, I kind of just uh, just sold all of that. I managed to avoid like two huge downturns. Where I, I think have... that's uh I think that's where a majority of us are with our crypto portfolios, huh, James? Where where the gains and the losses kind of you're e evened out, or you've accepted the loss as a I, at least I tried. Type there of, are type of... there are no losses if you don't sell. I'll, I'll put, yeah. so I'm, I'm hodling for the long term. All right. So I'm not going to be experiencing any losses. I'm going to just, you know, make sure the world knows that. But, um, you know, after your foray into crypto, you know, you know, for whatever it was worth, you know, better for better or worse. Um, where, where did you go from there? So like you're, you're experimenting with some location uh, in Mexico. Like we're really curious to see where your life went in that direction. Yeah. So um, I, a couple of my great friends from from London came over and one of them said that her friend was was in Tulum I'd never been to Tulum before and so I said let's let's go to Tulum so we went there and I was moaning about Tulum right because 
I'm so old fashioned. I hate hype and all of this stuff. And I don't, I don't really use Instagram. Um, and so we went to Tulum to, to have a party and I met uh, my now girlfriend there. And, you know, we, we had conversations and fell in love and all that kind of stuff. And um, basically she was, she was here for only a few weeks, but, and she had to go back to Hong Kong. So I, um, you know, she said the best thing that could happen to her was if she had COVID. And so, uh, you know, I um, <laughs> managed to speak to someone and get like a positive and a, a sort of negative COVID test result for her and said, you know, you choose if you want to come and, and stay here and get to know each other and all that kind of stuff. And she took it. So we spent three months uh, in Playa and in Tulum. And after that, like for her birthday party, I met my now business partner at a beach party, uh, a London guy. And he said, he said, what are you doing with yourself here? And I said, you know, I'm just enjoying myself. I'm kind of, uh, I was thinking about retiring. I had enough money to, to retire on a very reduced lifestyle in Mexico for when I did numbers, something like, you know, 40 or 50 years. Um, and he was like, oh, well, you know, we're selling real estate in Tulum and it's going amazing. I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll come to your house next week and, and we chat. So I met this guy at a beach party, went to his house the next week. And I just, I fell in love with the house. It was, it was beautiful, beautiful house. And, um, you know, I said to my buddy, we both went uh, to Tulum at the same time. He's from, he's from the States. I said, how much do you think this house is, is worth? And he was like, two, two million, two million dollars. I was like, yeah, it seems like that. So we went inside and I said, hey, uh, like, how much is this house going for? And he was like, it's half a million dollars. And I was just like, wow, that's, that's insane that you can have this beautiful house, like how large it is for half a million dollars. And so I was really interested. I, I invited my girlfriend uh, to come and see it the next week. And I said, I really want to you know, buy this house. And then I started learning more about the Tulum Villa market and how lucrative it was. Um, I, I joined the real estate company, started learning much more about the market and um, bought the house. And now we're, we're, that's the house that we're, we're renovating. So it's really interesting how your life can be on rails until you're, you know, 34, 35. And then you, you move somewhere random and then this complete inertia and serendipity takes you in a completely different you know, a completely different path and journey. I've always had the impression on life that a lot of happiness comes from change and the willingness to accept change and new opportunities that pop up. Because you can get stuck in the monotony of any life routine that you just find yourself to be, you know, participating in every day. Wake up, go to the gym, go to work, come home, make dinner, you know, go to bed, wake up, go to the gym, go to work, come home, make dinner. Um, but when you're traveling around and you're open to opportunities and new experiences, it's really when those opportunities find you um, and you can take it, take, um, you know, advantage of that. And that's that's where I think personally that I found a lot of happiness is moving to new places and experiencing new things. And uh, your experiences with going to Mexico is just the epitome of that, for sure. Yeah, yeah totally. And I, I had a taste of that in Hong Kong and I, I thought about you know, you mentioned earlier about how 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 your peers. Um, well, when I left the UK and went to Hong Kong, my trajectory of experience went exponentially. Went exponential. I I visited fourteen countries, like exotic Asian countries, in one year, while having a full time job in banking. Right, and I I was just like, wow, you can you can have it all. And you know, when you go back and see your friends, things haven't really moved at the same kind of pace for them. They're still doing the same kind of thing. So you're really not actually losing anything by taking that step and, and making that change. Um, and, and I think change is, it keeps everything fresh, right? You learn more and it's exciting. That's what, what is exciting about life, I think. I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> I, I think uh, a ton of people that are listening to this podcast are looking for a change. That's why you know they're listening about financial freedom, about financial independence. That's why we try to bring stories exactly like yours into the fold so people can hear about, you know, regular people just like them, you know, just taking a stand for their own life and going out there and, you know, taking the action that they need, 
whatever that may be, trying something new, investing in something different, losing money, you know, making money. We've all done it. You know, the most successful people have all lost a crap load of money and have stories of things not going well. But the difference was that they can they continued on and kept doing it, which is really great. So tell us about what's going on, you know, in Tulum. Why is it a good market? You know, why is the investment opportunity down there? You believe so amazing. Someone that's, you know, spent the last 10 years in investment banking, traveling all over the world. You know, what makes Tulum so special? Yeah, it's, um, well, I mean, it's, where do you start? It's uh, it's a really magical place. And I don't want to sound too woo-woo about it, but a lot of people talk about the energy here, the inertia. I mean, certainly for my life, it's been a, it's been a whirlwind since coming here. But I mean, you've, it's on the Mexican Caribbean coast, you know, for people who don't know where it is. Uh, it's a 90 minute drive from Cancun. They're building a new airport. Tulum International Airport should be ready end of next year, beginning first quarter of 2024, I believe. Uh, they've already started building that. And so, you know, you're, it's, it's really well positioned for Americans because a lot of Americans are familiar with uh, Cancun Spring Break. And that became like a real big thing. Um, and then Playa del Carmen, I mean, Cancun was, was started in the, in the 70s. It's like 50 years old now. Uh, and then it's, if you think about the Mexican Caribbean coast, we call it the path of progress. So Cancun did really well. That spread to Playa del Carmen a little bit south, and now it's coming to Tulum. And uh, Tulum was really a concept inspired by a very successful Mexican uh, actor and some of his friends. Uh, they decided they found this cute little beach town, which was a fishing village, and uh, decided to bring some some cool, wealthy people, celebrities, hot girls, all that kind of thing. And they built this notion of Tulum being this absolute paradise uh, with the best parties, uh, really luxurious, uh, amazing food and, and a great experience for everyone uh, to be nestled in nature. It's a very similar um, analogy to Bali, I would say. It's probably Bali for uh, the Americas. And to be honest, like a lot of the accents, uh, you know, the styling, the design architecture has been inspired by Bali for sure. Um, and so when you have those fundamentals, when you have, you know, America is just a short ride away. Uh, you have COVID, which meant that, you know, the price of single family homes went up by 40%. Uh, you got big places in Florida, Texas, California. Um, you know, they're like, well, how do I cash out? And where do I put my money? And they're starting to see more and more talk about Tulum. And, uh, and we're seeing a real big trend of uh, US citizens doing that. They want a holiday home in uh, in the Mer Mexican Caribbean that they can rent out yeah. completely hands-free. And so just to give you some ideas of the numbers uh, on, the, on the villas that we rent, uh, they're, 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 they're all easily under $600,000, $800,000, which are prices that aren't really seen in the States. Now, obviously, the reason because the, the delta between the price here and there is because of lending credit. So typically you put a quarter of the price down in the US and the rest is funded by the bank. But here there isn't such an established uh, lending market. There isn't such a, a large credit market here, especially for pre-construction. And so everything is, is cash here. Um, so we are awaiting you know, certain fundamental factors that will really start to push up the prices of accommodation here. Uh, the airport being one, the Mayan train, and also the introduction of cheaper credit, uh, for sure, as more, more companies come down to Tulum. So um, I think you've got you know, a number of factors. You've got those fundamentals I just mentioned, and you've also got this wow factor on Instagram, uh, all these influencers, top model celebrities all coming to Tulum. It's created a real buzz of interest to, uh, you know, north of the border for sure. And that's why we're seeing Tulum really, really appreciating. Uh, in is, the, uh, is the predominant language still Spanish? Or are you finding that, you know, people can get by with English or some other language? Yeah, people can get by uh, in Eng with English here. It's... Um, I, I live here, so I try and speak as much Spanish as possible. Um, but 
you know, when you're doing your de build or development project, <laughs> it really shows you how good you are at Spanish. So um, I, I haven't particularly uh, learned that much Spanish. I've been here a year and I, mostly I'm getting through in English. All of my business done through the real estate brokerage is done in, in, in English. Um, and my dealings with my build team, et cetera, is, is done in English as well. So I'm predominantly speaking English. So is is the brokerage you're, so the brokerage you're working with, are they typically trying to get people who are not in Tulum to buy, you know, these villa opportunities and these kind of vacation home properties yeah. or so like what, what's your market demographic with, with, with that brokerage? Yeah. So our, our brokerage, we, um, we typically, our clients are from the U S and Canada. I and mean, you don't get many Europeans over here. It's just not really a holiday destination. The flight's too, too long. Um, so most of our clients, nearly all of our clients are US uh, and, and Canadian citizens. And our niche, what we try to provide as a service to the market is to help uh, US citizens essentially navigate buying a holiday home in Mexico. Uh, there are a lot of barriers and worries uh, about Mexico. If you think about the, the sort of narrative that's been put out over the last decade and beyond uh you know trump was the highlight right talking about building a wall etc um and all of the narcos and all of the stuff on netflix you see right there's a there's a real anti-mexico narrative being perpetuated out there that's just being absorbed subliminally by u.s citizens so they might want their place in the sun down here in Tulum and have heard about how amazing it is on Instagram, but there's still a lot of apprehension around actually putting, pulling the trigger and putting a hundred to $400,000 down here. So, you know, my job, our job as a real estate brokerage is to try and, well, explain my experiences of being a foreigner buying here. Uh, I've bought a villa. I bought, I built, I bought land here and I'm doing a, a construction project. So I have, uh, good insight into the the sort of if there is risk involved and how to mitigate those risks. So in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is make it comfortable for people to invest, to achieve that uh, holiday home, or if they want a vacation rental to increase their vacation rental portfolio, and they're not happy with the returns in their hometown, you know, Tulum, the way it's blowing up, the, the rental, uh, the cash on cash ROIs are are incredible right now, especially for the villa market. Yeah, I mean, I can attest to like my wife and I, Danielle, we've been coming to Mexico for, you know, the past seven years, uh, at least two, if not three times a year um, to Playa del Carmen, Riviera Maya, have spent a little bit of time in Tulum. And the overall sense for us is it's it's safe or we wouldn't be going back all of the time. Now, obviously, you know, you can get caught up if you're not, you know, doing the right things um, in some sketchy situations. But overall, I felt like the vibe is is very safe. And we've actually looked at investing, you know, in Playa del Carmen, in Tulum um, to be able to to buy a vacation rental, someplace that we can rent out when we're not there and also have a place because um, our plan is to retire somewhere in the Caribbean um, where, you know, your dollar stretches a lot farther. So let's break down a little bit on if someone would like to buy a vacation property in Mexico. You said that the lending isn't, um, isn't, isn't like it is here in the U.S. So are people having to put down, you know, pay for these projects 100% cash out of pocket are we just looking at a larger down payment instead of a 20 to 25? Are we looking at 30, 40%? Can they still get financing? Like kind of break that down for us a little bit for our listeners. Sure, absolutely. So there are a number of methods uh, that you can purchase here. So the method I took was to purchase a re resale. So if you have a property that's already in existence, it might have some rental data on it. Um, and you might want to like buy that and do a remodel to try and, you know, try and really just get the, the, the value out of it. In resale instances, you are looking at paying all of it in cash. Um, there's no real delay. Uh, some sellers will agree to monthly payments over a year. 
and so the buyer if they want to rent it out would like to you know agree possession early on before the full payment is made so some of our clients do that they put down a deposit of uh, 30 to 50 percent depending on what the seller would like and then they pay off the rest either you know, six months or 12 months um, but for me I just I paid it all in in one go um, and I put down a you know like a 10 percent uh, deposit just to hold it while the uh, promissory contract was was being put together um so the that, majority of the way is is you know you got you've got if you want to invest down there you, you basically have to do all cash there's no external lending or there's no third party lending options at this particular moment there is there is but it's expensive so when you look at fees you're looking at nine to eleven percent per annum which is punitive you know that's going to really wreck your roi and we don't we typically don't uh push our investors down that route um it's that's really also like you said another reason why if lending comes to the area you know you'll see prices explode because people won't have to you know spend three four five hundred thousand dollars they'll be able to take that money and put it down on someplace and make payments. Plus, I'm sure because the market is brand new, a lot of the people that are getting in now are, you know, buying in those prime locations um, because they're trying to attract people. So they're not saving the beachfront places, you know, for down the road, right? Yeah, no, exactly. So, you know, Tulum is really a lot of it is about the beach here. It's absolutely perfect here. So beachfront lots, they are in the multi-million dollars and it's typically cash. You know, you can't get financing. Um, 75,000 square foot beachfront lot, uh, $10 million. So it's not cheap. Um, but the amount, if you build a hotel there and rent that out, you're going to make a serious, serious amount of, uh, of cash there. Um, but yeah, so we, you know, going back to what we were saying before. So we have resales. The other thing is pre-construction. And this is a form of financing, if you like, uh, developer financing. You put 30% down typically, and then you make payments until the, the delivery date. So this can be 12 to 24 months off. And it allows people who have a bit of cash in the bank that's not doing anything uh, to put that down. And then with their monthly salary or investments or both to start paying down at the end of, every, of everything, they've got a home that they can use for a few months a year uh, and then rent it out. Um, and the rest of the time so that's again if you want to uh, look at raising financing it would have to be done in your home in your home jurisdiction so like raising money via a HELOC or you know cashing out through a different uh, method or looking at friends and family another way that people raise funds for this is to incorporate a tax as advantageous uh, corporation in Delaware South Dakota Wyoming uh, and then that company will purchase the property and so you know you can get a group of friends together five or ten friends raise the cash into a bank account and we've seen that done before yeah my gear is already you know going on getting a couple friends together and pulling the cash and fig figuring out an opportunity to buy something with cash i mean it's uh seems like a great place to be especially for getting a couple boys together and going somewhere to vacation and hang out um but you know I, jeremy really curious you, you've got most of your assets right now seem to be in real estate, working through the brokerage and doing your developments. But what are your goals uh, moving forward for the next couple of years? Like, what is what is Jeremy trying to do as far as some sort of benchmark? Do you have anything that you're really trying to accomplish um, that you can kind of tell us about? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just uh, to pick up on your point about um, on, on concentration of assets, I. I think I've, I've always concentrated my assets. I've always gone all in. And I know in the financial press and on YouTube and various talking heads are always talking about diversification. Why? Because they want to sell you an ETF tracker, the S&P 500. Yeah, maybe you'll make 8% a year, but after fees, you, you'll make a lot less. So there's this whole diversification myth that's perpetuated out in the financial media. Um, I, if you really want to double your money, then you, and, and you actually want it to make a, a difference to your life. You have to con get concentrated. So, you know, in the whiskey, I put all my money into that. 
I actually just made some money on the side so I didn't have to sell it. But the first apartment, I put all my money into that. I actually borrowed some money from like friends and family to get into that and then pay them back. But yeah, I have uh, basically all of my assets now in Tulum. Um, and I, I mean, I still own property in the UK. I have a, a flat that I'm, I'm trying to sell. I'm Airbnb being that at the moment and that's doing really well. But I do like to have all my assets uh, consolidated because I believe that if you have an idea and you've researched it, and all the fundamentals are there, you want to lever up and really go for it. Otherwise, you know, the idea is not that great. It can't be that great if you don't have full confidence. I, I love that so much, Jeremy. Like, I'm all for concentrated portfolios. And it flies in the face of every conventional piece of advice you'll get from any financial advisor or whatever, because they want you to diversify. And, and I think you're right. I think you're spot on. It's because they want to sell you something. But even if you look at someone like, Warren Buffett's portfolio, extremely concentrated in his holdings. Like he went all in on Geico. He he bet the farm on some of his acquisitions. Um, and that's really where you're going to find some of your returns. So I'm I'm 100% with, with you on that. On the flip side, though, you know, concentration does come risk. So, you know, you just have to have an appreciation of that. But if you see investing as a lifetime experience, you, you might not hit a grand slam each time on your concentrated risks. But you know, yes. you're going to double over and over multiple times. It'll it'll cover some of those investments that didn't pay off, like, not like you and the crypto experience and things like that. Like, you know, you just got to take that risk. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, um, I think with real estate, it definitely has its its time and a place. And in the US, you have the, the benefit of the rollover relief, right? You can just keep rolling and rolling and rolling and you have financing. You know, that's something in the UK. We don't have that uh, rollover. If we sell something and, and buy another property, we're still liable for capital gains. So, you know, that's the velocity of money props up any any market for assets. And so that's why the UK economy is, is kind of stagnating because uh, the UK economy is primarily, a lot of it, driven by real estate, as most developed uh, countries are. And so I think the U.S. investors, this is something that we always come up with, um, come up against, I should say. Investors say, well, I could put 250K down there and earn 15% ROI on a condo after everything's all said and done. Or I can, you know, uh, lever up 4X and buy a million dollar property in the U.S. and then earn you know, X amount, whatever, you know, 10% or something lower. But because you've got that benefit of leverage, and when borrowing costs were low, you can make a spread there. There's like a little, um, you know, a little bit of uh, maneuvering, let's say you can, your know, profit margin, let's say on there. Uh, it's just an arbitrage really between the, the credit market. But in what we're seeing now is rates going up and the rates don't really go like this. They jump like in the UK, in the UK lending market and mortgages, they've jumped like two percentage points. Um, trackers are out to like, six percent now so we've gone from a three percent uh mortgage or one percent mortgage two years ago three years ago when i you know struck my mortgage one and a half percent it's gone up to like four or five percent now so you know the, the credit market moves quick and lenders pull their rates really quickly and you could get stuck so it is it is really important to remember that sort of downside um, as well to, to to mortgaging and lending and the credit market in general. Yeah, totally. So when j just before before we move into our last phase of uh, of the podcast, I do have one last question. So when you're talking about these, you know, fifteen to twenty five percent returns, are these renting out your you know vacation homes? on like a monthly basis um a yearly basis is this like airbnb is this through like kind of like a travel company that your brokerage has like kind of just touch base on that real quick on how you know people can expect or you know are you guys are kind of factoring in these returns on these properties down there in that market sure so here we primarily focus on short-term Airbnb and other online travel agencies, so booking.com. We focus on the velocity of uh, bookings and high turnover. So it's short-term property management for holiday makers here. 
And we're looking for, you know, an occupancy in, in the big villas, you can get an occupancy of around 75%. Um, I mean, obviously, if you just put your prices down, the occupancy will go up, but um, at a decent market rate, around 75%. Um, you know, my, my first data point when uh, joining the brokerage and speaking to uh, US uh, clients, new clients on the phone, was I spoke to a guy from New Jersey and he said, I love Tulum, come down there with my wife every year and multiple times a year. We spent $17,000 on a villa, a four bedroom villa for four nights. And that, I was just like, what? Did you get the numbers wrong on that? Like, that is insane. So I started to, you know, look into that a lot. And, um, you know, just, just around the corner, like a few streets away from my place is a five bedroom villa that grossed uh, $300,000 last year. Uh, you know, these are decent sizes of, of, you know, this is decent revenue. And if you have a, a cleaning staff, a maintenance guy, your costs of property management are very low. Um, so, you know, there, there's decent margin to be, to be made here. And a lot of people and a lot of developers focus on the condo market because it's a supply driven game. So the developers, they want to build, they want to buy uh, land with high density so they can build big condos and sell them out 100K because more people have got 100K than got half a million in the bank. And it's an easy sell. But what we see in the market is a surplus of these condos. Um, and so at the moment, there's 7,700 listings on Airbnb. And, you know, in the, in the condo market, we're, we're forecasting to see this rise sort of exponentially over the next few years. And so what happens in that kind of market is that your average daily rate for a condo will go down. People's returns start to go down. So where they were promised 12%, 10% by the developer, now they're actually netting only 6% and they want to get out. They, they're thinking, you know, I don't want to get, do this anymore. Lots of condos hit the market, increase in supply, the price falls. And so that's why, you know, whenever I speak to clients, we try and push them towards either very unique condos that are very close to the beach or have like a penthouse element because the number one search term in Tulum is penthouse with private private pool or we take them to the other demographic the bachelorette parties you know the big yoga retreats the people who want to host you know they want to have a group of 10 to 18 people in one place a private compound they don't want to see anyone else for a week that's the luxury villa market and returns there are, are huge because there aren't many six, seven bedroom villas out there in, in Tulum currently. Great, great, great answer. Tons of info on this. I know I'm definitely going to be reaching out to get some more. And I think this is a perfect segue into our last segment of the show that James and I like to call the big four. Okay. <laughs> so James, uh, take it away. Jeremy, we're going to hit you with some hard questions here. Um, so what's something that you do in your life that feels like a financial hack, something like a cheat code uh, on your path towards financial independence? Um, well, I think uh, for this, it's, <laughs> yeah, and it's always run the numbers. Like I'm, I'm a CPA, right? I, lo I love numbers. I don't get excited by by sales talk. I like to see the numbers. I want to see rent, revenues, et cetera. Um, so I always think about numbers. I'm always obsessed with numbers. Where does that come from? It comes from, uh, I don't want to say obsession because it's got a negative connotation, but a real prioritization or a focus on money and just making sure you, you've got enough money. And that stems from me being you know, poor when I was growing up. So I guess my financial hack was actually a product of my circumstances growing up where you're always thinking about the money. Like in any type of opportunity, you're always thinking about the money and the numbers. Um, so I would say as a financial hack, you've always got to run the numbers, always trying to understand the numbers, not just of something that you are investing in, but what people around you are doing. You know, if you've got a friend, if you've got mom and dad, and they've just bought a house, how much have they paid for it? How much are they renting out for? You know, get an understanding of the world in numbers because otherwise you can't understand pricing. And you can't, if you don't understand pricing, you don't know how much to pay for something. And that's something that just over time you need to need to know. You have to understand the numbers. Love it. 
Love it, love it, love it. And for everybody that's in real estate that's listening to the podcast, they totally know that that makes a ton of sense when it comes to buying and selling your property. But I love how you said bring that into your everyday world and really know what the cost of stuff is and what's going on. So we call this next one resources. So are there any books, podcasts, or people um, that have really influenced you know, your mindset, your financial journey throughout life, and that you feel uh, any one of our listeners would benefit from uh, checking out? Well, of course, this podcast, The Real FI, right? That's an amazing snapshot into what's going on right now. Um, because a lot of the books that are popular, the ones that I read, you know, how to win friends and influence people. These are old books written a long time ago. Yes, they definitely have relevance now, um, even more so than ever, because you're seeing a lot of the self-help industry getting carried away. And it's so confusing now. Do you read a book? Do you go on YouTube? Do you go to a podcast? Uh, I have a few books. I have um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think that really teaches you how to deal with people. Um, and also, uh, a long time ago, I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, before I read How to Win Friends and Influence People, actually. I, that really made me understand about trying to set up a, a, a small business versus a big business and getting people to work for you. The flip side of that, I will say, is that a lot of people get stuck in small businesses that can't scale. Um, a great example, and I'm not trying to scale this business by any means, but a typical business that can't really scale is a, a real estate brokerage. If you're dealing with a, a, a small market, you'd have to go through, for a much wider market. Um, so currently where we are, uh, we are getting really focused in Tulum. So looking to scale overseas or to other places is not, uh, is not really in our um, sort of thinking right now. Um, so when you do read these books, you have to think, you know, about what the sort of downside and you know, whether pursuing a certain course of action is really for you. Because a lot of my friends started small businesses that couldn't scale, right? And I just went down the career path and ended up just, you know, managing to make more and more money uh by, by doing it that way so kiyosaki's book is great to understand the principles when you're at your early age but you, you do definitely need to um understand what the pitfalls of that are and try and bring it into a real world um the next book that i would uh really suggest to um tie in with how to win friends and influence pe people is the 48 laws of power uh, by robert green now, th this is a fantastically entertaining book. You can get the podcast on YouTube. Uh, it's just a wonderful story. If you're in the office, uh, you can just listen to this. He, he uses real world examples for historical huge moments of huge, uh, you know, sort of positioning for power uh, back in like the medieval times. He talks about Galileo. He talks about all the, the great masters vying for power. He talks about Nikolai Tesla. Um, and, and his like downfall. So he uses all of these um, historical references that are really interesting uh, and, and actually have played out in real life to reinforce those 48 laws of power. And I think this book, whether you're in the, if you're in the corporate game, it is so important to listen to this podcast because it teaches you about people's real intentions and, you know, they might be smiling to you on the surface, but there's always an alternative uh, intention there. And it really helps to equip you with the tools that you need to, to do well in the corporate game, I think. I love that book recommendation. I've, I've heard it being recommended by people that I've come across in life who have found a lot of success in investing. It's the first time it's been recommended on this podcast, I believe. Um, but that's yep. definitely one that I'm going to be ordering from Amazon to pick up. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, but it's real. It's real. So uh, that's that one. And the last one uh, is No Excuses by Brian Tracy. It is just really uh, a, a motivational book. It's not really a, a kind of tactic book or it's really just no excuses. And that kind of philosophy to live your life by is really important, especially when you come up against certain hurdles in your journey to financial independence. I love it. Those are some great recommendations for some books and resources. And our listeners need to listen and go buy some of those books and, you know, dig in. Yeah. So Jeremy, this is our um, 
future you question. I want you to paint a picture of what your business or personal life looks like five years in the future. Typically, uh, we don't have people calling in from Tulum, Mexico on the Caribbean coast beach of Mexico. Um, so like you're, you're living a pretty cool ideal life right now, but you know, if it can get any more ideal, uh, what is, what does Jeremy's life look like five years from now? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with your point there. And that's one thing I will say, um, I was actually quite guilty of it throughout my life, like always living in the future because you create these grand goals, uh, at work, it could be a promotion or the next investment opportunity. You're always saying, oh, if only I just made 50K, if only I made 100K, 150, 200, la, la, la. And that never ends. So it's really important to try and enjoy the journey and, and be uh, in the moment, actually, throughout this whole whole financial journey, uh, independence, uh, sorry, journey through financial independence. Um, but five years from now, I, um, I really hope that we will be doing really well on the Villa Rental. Um, for me and my girlfriend, that will give us some real financial independence. We can go traveling. Uh, we've got a lot of ambition over the next few years to go and see as many countries as possible, soak in the culture, learn about the world. Um, so we want the, you know, the villa to perform well, achieve passive income. Um, on the, so, yeah, I mean, how do I see my life? I, you, you want to be able to travel and experience new things without any limitations. And that's something that's really important. Like I, I don't, so many um, like social media and financial news really focuses on, on the apex of uh, financial society, Bezos, you know, Zuckerberg, all these, and Elon Musk, all these really rich guys, but you don't need to be like that. You don't become a billionaire to achieve independence and happiness, you know, just as long as you can afford the things that you need without expending too much time and energy getting it that is really, really fulfilling. And so we're going to use the passive income from this villa. Um, we're hoping to, to net around 150 to 175, 180 from it uh, in dollars per, per year. And that will give us enough money to you know, travel around um, and you know, enjoy life for the next few years. On the brokerage side, um, we are looking to, to try and uh, increase the number of of investment professionals that we have essentially um so you know we have a lot of of really uh, great people out here who love real estate love selling real estate and so we're, we're sort of putting together a kind of learning course to help people uh get into real estate become a real estate agent uh and also just to help people who are investing in real estate uh, understand the nuts and bolts and you know, I'll be on that syllabus. We'll be talking about investing in a foreign country, investing in Mexico, how to deal with the build team, and then also how to to generate leads, all this kind of thing for for real estate for people who are interested. Uh, and the reason why I mentioned that is because it's very difficult for someone with nothing. Um, you know, if you're just out of high school, uh, you know, you're not going to go into a, a corporate job in investment banking or into tech. Well, what do you do? You know, a lot of really successful people have started in real estate. And I think it's a really, uh, it's a great avenue for people who don't have anything uh, to, to try and start building some wealth so they themselves can invest. So we're, we're trying to sort of build out that platform um, with the real estate brokerage and try and educate more people about the opportunities in Mexico. Fantastic. All sounds great. All sounds great. <clears throat> well, Jeremy, for everyone that's been listening this far, you know, for everyone that wants to get in contact with you, say they were inspired by you, motivated by you, want to learn how to, you know, invest in Tulum and check out some properties, where can they get in touch with you? Where's the best place to to get in contact and where, where should they reach out? Yeah, so Instagram is always the best method I find. So tulum.land, that's our Instagram handle. And uh, like my personal Instagram is uh, Dream Life Tulum. I haven't really been very active on it, but the whole uh, idea behind that uh, Instagram is to talk about lifestyle, um, traveling, investing, all of that kind of stuff, uh, which I haven't really got around to yet. <laughs> um, but that's that's the idea. So Dream Life Tulum is me, and uh, Tulum dot land is our brokerage. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. For everyone that's still listening, if you like this podcast, if you hated this podcast, please leave us a review. 
Apple, Spotify, Google. For everyone watching on YouTube, drop a comment down below. Make sure make sure that you're subscribed um, to help out the ag algorithm. And we will catch you next time. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to the real fi podcast where you learn from the investors that have lived the hard lessons for you